And for some oh, reason, I, for some reason, I've been living here for about a long time already. We, we moved from L.A. We moved from New York to L.A. and then from L.A. After a while, we got sick of that and we went, came up here. And it, it's beautiful in the summer. It rains from like September, October till May. Just rains. Huh? Well, I and, grew up in Chicago. That's familiar. Right. And so uh, <clears throat> I love it up here in the summertime. I'm not that keen on it up here, but my wife loves it. So, uh, yeah, we've been up here for a long time. It's a beautiful city. Uh, my husband and I have been there a number of times, and uh, it's I love it. Well, next time you're up here, let me know, and you'll come over. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, we were talking about your brother. Right. I, my brother, Alan Katz, with two yeah. L. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I first came to town in, 19, uh -oh. in 1985, <laughs> uh, I had a... I, it was a script that I had written that was my agent of William Morris was sending around. It was called Down to Earth. And uh, I had meetings set up and I would walk into meetings. And your brother had a script around at the exact same time called The Hunchback of UCLA. And I would walk into meetings and, hello, hello, how are you? Nice to meet you. And they'd say, we really love The Hunchback of UCLA. My God. <laughs> and... The first couple of times before I got wise, I'd go, oh, uh, that's not me. It's... And they suddenly look at me like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> Why are we talking to you? <laughs> so, you know, the rest of that meeting was usually not good. After a while, I got wise and I'd say, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad you liked uh, that script. Uh, I think you'll like what, uh, what I'm selling next. Uh, so uh, Alan, yeah, I, I had to, I, I can't, I don't call myself Alan Katz. I call myself A.L. Katz because of your brother. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, his story about um, playing a role in that movie in his name. Please tell it. Okay. Um, he wanted to be able to get movies made with less interference as i'm sure you both understand <laughs> um, kind of like the goal for so many writers was woody allen let's just get a movie made and they let me do what i want to do so he wanted to play this role of the hunchback and um sag uh said there's somebody else with your name and sag <laughs> can't use your name that's right that's how <laughs> and, it is in sag it's not the same way yeah. in the writer's guild so he said um well, I've been working a long time. People know me as Alan Cass. Well, you can't use the name. He said, can I use any name I want? They said, yes. So he uh, said, I would like to change my name to Starring Alan Katz. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't remember how it all played out. Obviously, that's... Uh... I, I do remember that hearing about that. No, yeah, that was... Wow, what, what, a, what, a great, uh, what, what a great response. And, and they said, yes. Now, do you have a brother, Stu? Because I have a brother, Stu. U A R T. So if it's you, it would be E W, right? So it's. No, I, in, in that, I, I, I'm alone. It's funny. I, I have always grown up being surrounded by other Alan Cassis. When I went to camp, sleepaway camp in Maine, I shared a bunk with another Alan Katz for a couple of years. It's so it's, crazy to me. I, 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 I was growing up, there were 150 Steve Cohen's. But there weren't that many Alan Katzes, you know, there weren't, I didn't know any others. Have you ever encountered another Phyllis Katz? I haven't, but I know they exist because one year on my birthday, my husband had looked up all of them and put their pictures on the package that he wrapped for me. <laughs> their pictures and then their identity. <laughs> things about all of them. It's funny, you know, you, I would love it if you would put us in touch with, with your brother. I would love to have the conversation I've never get, had had the chance right. to have have with him, and there are some other stories too. Where, uh, God, I, I I was mistaken for him, and it was so awkward, so <laughs> awkward. But I, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna yeah. bother. You know, I, this. I I don't even remember how I know him because I came out of New York. I produced a play there called El Grande de Coca Cola. Oh my gosh, that was you. That was the biggest thing in the world yeah. when I first moved out here. Yeah, yeah. and and. Uh, and from that, somehow I met your brother, I think, when I first came out to L.A. And didn't didn't know another Alan Katz until I met the one we, we're talking to now. And I, I don't recall how or why our, our paths crossed, you know. Well, he wrote for Laugh-In and then uh, right. 
And then he and Don Rio became a writing team for, I think, something like eight or nine years. Yeah, it's like a lot of the writers from Saturday Night Live, the original guys, <clears throat> like Alan Zweibel. I, I knew Alan from New York from the first year of Saturday Night Live. And we were friends for many years. And Alan then moved to L.A. And I knew him in L.A. And then I lost track of him for many, many years. And recently, I'd say in the last year or two, I called him. And I said, so, Alan, um, are, you, are you still in L.A.? And he said, Gil, I moved back to New York probably 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I and I said, <laughs> right. the news travels slowly. <laughs> right. But, but, but enough about all these other people. Uh, let's let's talk about you, Phyllis. Yikes. OK, uh, let's you come from Chicago. You you, you are from the Chicago cats. Uh, <laughs> were the Chicago cats is known for anything in particular. Um, not that I know of. And outside of my own family, I didn't know a lot of cats, strangely enough. But um, but uh, if you're asking about my family, we were known for. Um, laughter uh, gets you through everything. That's what we were known for. And everybody in the family was, um, even to this day, including who we married and who and and the children and every, everybody is either in uh, the arts, law, or, or uh, psychotherapy. <laughs> and by I have two nephews, one still in college and one uh, in Canada. He goes to McGill. And oh, cool. uh, the other one graduated uh, Yale uh, this year. And so they're still not sure where they're going to land yet, but they lean toward the same stuff. Uh, uh, all right. The uh, I don't know a whole lot about the cats part of my family because my grandmother, uh, they were Cohens from from uh, from Lithuania. They they looked down upon my, my grandfather's from that cat's family, and she kept my father and his brother away from the cats. They were. I I have a my cousin has been looking into the cats, and and it's it, it this is a huge question mark. So every time I I meet a, a, a cat, I I I have to actively wonder. I don't know. I mean, I, it's just this, this, this delusion of royalty in this world is, is so um, uh, unfortunate. It's just unfortunate. Mm. We look down on you, you look down on us and all that, and, you know, like we're people, you know? So I, I don't know a lot of uh, uh, cats is um, not because I wouldn't do anything, have anything to do with them, but because I don't know them. Um, so we may be related. It's, I like I said I I I always have to wonder. I uh, uh, using the using the equal time doctrine. Are there any Adlers in your family? <laughs> nope. No. No Adlers. Well, that was a quick answer. This was fascinating for your <laughs> listeners. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, we we really scrape at at <laughs> the nitty and the gritty. Yeah, I mean, we're really getting down deep here. <laughs> no, All no right. Adlers, but I've known Adlers. All right. Aside yeah. from aside from you know your the necessity of of growing up in your family of of having to have a sense of humor, uh, what else suddenly made you go, hey, I get comedy? Was there was there a first moment when when, when you could look at and, and suddenly think, all right, I I think I understand how to be funny. What makes funny work? I don't think there was a moment. I think we just, we reached for what was funny and, and cause it, what was funny and what was um, fun and what was an observation. It was just, it was, it was part of my um, education as much as anything else you learn in a family. Cause it's just how everybody talked to each other. And we were as dysfunctional as anybody else, but, but we were lovingly dysfunctional and, and, and there was a lot of laughter, uh, e even in horrible situations. You know, was there a particular member of your family who was especially, boy, they really had it in, in spades? Alan, <laughs> but my brother Stu, who became an attorney and a, a and also a, a, a really uh, accomplished bebop musician keyboards and vibes and uh he would be a side man for a lot of people who'd come to chicago he he has right. a he has a cd out called uh family affair 
Yeah, with Iris Sullivan. Yeah, is, is that still available in on? Uh, is it available on Spotify or Apple Music? Can can we plug Probably it? Might even might even be able to get uh, um, get it through Amazon. Amazon, I'm not even sure, but yeah. He, so he's he's pretty accomplished, but really funny. And and, and my dad was a vaudevillian. For real, an actual vaudevillian. Actual vaudevillian. Oh uh, well, hey, you know, uh, well, why didn't you say so? <laughs> I, well, that, well, that explains a ton. A little, and and my mother was just funny in her own way. She was funny. She just made me laugh. We were. It wasn't like um, everybody going out to eat after the comedy store. You know, where everybody's like shooting one-liners back and forth. By the way, which I can say can be fun, can be not fun. It depends. But uh, <laughs> but it no, we were just. It just was. Um, but you grew up in the business. There was, was yeah, but 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 there no, was something. There was no, my dad was a salesman in the garment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but was a stenographer. It was just you know. But it was there. The uh, that was there in his past. It was in his blood. Yeah. You know that that need to. Yeah. The ability to get out there and hey. He was a song and dance man. Between that and the guy who goes out and tells jokes, these are the bravest people on the planet. Yeah, I mean, my mother and my and her two sisters um, created a, a charity group in Chicago uh, named after my grandmother that I don't know if it's still going, but it went on long after my mother died. And and they um, they used to just do good works, charity. And, and they would have uh, they would have dinner dances and they would have shows where the wives would, you know, do stuff at the show. And I, one year they had my father MC it. And I was about 17 at the time and a girlfriend of mine and I went to see it. And um, he would just say, call out a topic. And they would call out a topic and he would have a joke for it because he had so many jokes in his repertoire. And and I mean, he really, he went the distance. The husbands were having the best time they'd ever had at one of these. They were- uh, I bet. It was, I, I bet. It, what, what a reference. I, it was kind of unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, all right. So, it, it all right. It makes there's there's logic to it. And hey, couldn't if he had been able to make his a successful living as a performer, mightn't he have done that instead? I don't know because the depression is my parents' generation, right? It killed everything for for so many people. So uh, by the time I was born. That, that was so far in his past yeah. that and he was a salesman in the garment industry and he was doing that. My mother had these very cool office jobs where she managed things and they worked really, really, really hard. And, um, and there was that. So the, the entertainment factor wasn't, wasn't considered a profession for any of us. Sure. Okay. All right. So, all right. But so, so there was still the pressure to, uh, you, you got to get a real job. Yeah, and but we weren't fighting that. I mean, it was, it, but it was nobody was thinking that way. I want, I wanted to be a dancer first. That's what I wanted to be, and then uh, I, it didn't, it just wasn't going in that direction. At some point, um, I didn't ever seriously pursue it. That was just the first thing I wanted to be after I wanted to be a princess as a little child, you know, and then I wanted to be a, a, a ballerina, and but really wanted to be a dancer. And then I bet you would have made an awesome princess. Well, sometimes I do now, but it's, well, there you go. You know, it, it never goes away. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I was always um, observing behavior in people and fascinated by it. And so I would pick up things and I would imitate things. So I would get, I would get, get character kinds of things. Yeah. And I was always writing and I would write, stories and song parodies and and little in fact i won an honor camper award when i was nine years old at day camp or 10 maybe because i wrote a <laughs> i wrote a takeoff on gun smoke that we did as part of a, a performance and i wrote it on arithmetic paper in pencil that's how I, that's I, that's the first thing i remember writing that was mm -hmm. <laughs> so, how, 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 how old were you at, at this point Nine. Nine or ten. Nine, nine or ten. Yeah. Great, great, great. So so you were noodling early on. This stuff was just beginning to percolate inside your head and yeah. it had to find its way out one way or another. Yeah. And when I was in high school, I, I can't remember who taught me, probably my dad, how you would take, oh my God, is this gonna make me seem old? But I am. So it's uh 
wax paper, if you took it over the newsprint with a with a butter knife, you could transfer it, and then you transfer it to uh, to regular paper. It was one of my favorite things to do. So even in high school, I would take them from comic books and write my own comic books, and you know about my friends and stuff. So I mean, that's just really that's what I did with my my free time when I wasn't allowed to go out, you know, if it was too late or if it was, you know, or, or chilling out after school before I did my homework. It, those were just stories. Um, you were desperate for an outlet. Probably. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or, or maybe just uh, unaware that that wasn't what everybody was doing. I don't know. In, in Chicago, of course, second city, you, you, encountered Second City there. You yeah. took classes from Second yeah. City. And was that a satisfying outlet? Yes. Um, I plugs in and it zaps. I went into, um, well, I saw Second City for the first time on my prom night, my senior prom night. My date took me to Second City and I, I just couldn't believe what I was watching. Them Best making- prom night ever. Yeah, and the people in the company uh, were 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 just so um, spectacular. And I, uh, and then a few years later, I was working a a day job at um, McGraw Hill Publishers. I was an as, editorial assistant and then an assistant editor or something like that. It's you know uh, sounds bigger than it was. And uh, I went over to Second City because they did written material too, to see if they, <laughs> I was so sophisticated, if they would um, be interested in buying any song parodies. So um, I walked in there and Joe Flaherty, remember Joe Flaherty? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. He's walking down the stairs with a bicycle and he says, can I help you? And I said, uh, yeah, do you buy song parodies? And he said, without any side eye, you know, he said, um, well, we don't, we write all our own material, but we have classes. And he handed me a brochure and it was a complete life changer. Complete life changer. I mean, I got into an improv class and thought, where have you been all my life? Mm-hmm. And uh, I I didn't even know what it was that I, that was calling to me about it. But, um, but I can tell you so many improvisers feel that way. I see it all the time at the Groundlings and I saw it at Second City. Sure, sure, sure. And um, so my first class was with Martin DeMott and then Josephine Forsberg, who was one of Viola Spolin's protégés. And she she became a mentor and a teacher. And um, through her, I, I and through improv itself and the kinds of people it drew, mm-hmm. um, uh, I started to believe in myself in a different way. And it was very subtle. Not, oh, I believe I can make it. It wasn't that. I, I, I just as a person, I started to feel more connected to humanity and more less alone. Oh, gosh, when you're up, in, it's one of the things that I learned when I took my class from you. And that particular class, it was a group of people that all, who just reconnected and I don't know if you remember the class, but I know I remember that I class. Remember which group you were with? Oh, there's Angela, Angela Ames. I think Kimmy Robertson was was in my class. Uh, it was just I don't know. There was a vibe in that room, and every week you, who knew what kind of magic could happen? And the confidence is exactly the thing. It's the confidence to to just trust the absolute that you can be honest in that moment and whatever happens. And you can deal with it. Whatever happens, you'll deal with it. Right. And so it's the willingness to let go and, and trust yourself in the moment. Uh, Wow. Wow. What a, yeah. To me, it was a revelation too. Now, had you been a performer before you touched improv? That, uh, trying to think it uh it was a while back i i mean you know at school and with friends and in school shows and things like that i done yeah, stuff but yeah. I, I and i wrote all the time but no i was not part of the theater scene i was intimidated by it 
I'm, uh, I didn't think I was good enough. Didn't, I <laughs> uh, was scared of, of a lot of it. And, um, it was just, it, it also was the time too. It was becoming a big, big thing and kept becoming a big thing. Yeah. 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 Years and years. So it was like a social activity for a lot of people who had no designs on doing anything with it other than meeting people and having fun. But it was your part of the playing field because there are an awful lot of people who can, they're great taking up, a, you know, taking a role and inhabiting it, but they can't, you know, improv scares the fuck out of them. I know, but if you can, if you can, if you can get them, if you can get them in the room and get them to trust, they, I've never seen anybody not get better except uh, for people who um, have their thing they do and they're, and they're shielded by it. I do mm. this thing. This is what I do. I I, I thought yeah. that it would be a way for me to just keep doing that in different circumstances. So if they have to do any changing or if they can't take any notes, I mean, simplest notes, the simplest notes, uh, then then they get stuck. And I, I, I can't even think of one person that applies to off the top of my head. But uh, but. Once they get in there, sometimes it, everybody works at their own pace, but sometimes it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. But once you start to let go, I, I have never seen anybody not get better. I've never seen anybody not get good enough to play the game. The, I don't mean the game like the game that everybody oh, talks yeah, about. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, no. You, you know, the thing that Gil and I pride ourselves on. Uh, it's the nature of our relationship. It's when we were doing Tales from the Crypt and, and all the projects we did, except for Bordello of Blood, to us, it was all about the collaborative process. And nothing uh, is more, you know, improv is the, is the, the, the collaborative process, process is nature. It's, it's right there at the core. It counts on improv. It's all about yes and. If it's, it's the, the word no destroys everything. Right. So- right. Uh, Where yeah. else can you go? It, the answer is always yes. Oh, right. do you like my hat? Yes, and I love the tropical birds. What are their names? Well, well, I mean, which doesn't mean that your character has to agree, but I mean, no, no, no. The but, answer is you lay something out, and a good improviser says, "Yeah." I mean, all right, I'll tell you where else that works. That works in uh, that works in jazz. Oh, sure, 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 sure. From sure. all different, I've seen it with my brother Stuhl play, and and they they would come. Sometimes they, they would just come from different places and they just show up and somebody's just mentioned oh, yeah, and they yeah. count it off and they're all there and it's fabulous. And the sum is greater than the parts. Boom. Yeah. So you, you moved to LA from Chicago with uh, some improv in your pocket. Uh, you moved here with five friends. Uh, well, I told you that it's true though, but it's, I, Hey, I do my research. Uh, I want to know whatever became of those people. Oh, um, well, uh, let's see. There were, let me think of who the five were. Because because you well, turned out okay. Was, one was, well, everybody turned out okay. One was um uh, one was Bill Steinkellner. Huh, okay. Uh and he cool. and his wife Sherry became executive producers on Cheers huh. and they wrote Sister Act that went to Broadway, huh. and then and she just did something, she just wrote Summerstock, um uh, a musical that's being done. Uh, All right. So LA, I, so I LA actually, ruined them. I actually worked with her a little bit. I uh, I gave Alan Menken his very first job in New York. Oh, okay. So and you worked. I, with and and from him, I met her, and we were talking about doing something. This is years ago. I, we were talking about doing something, you know, musical together a, a long, long time ago. But uh, I didn't realize that she came out of Chicago. She didn't build it. Oh, build it. Okay. Met her here, but um. And, and did you ever run into Ron House in, in uh, Second City or in Chicago? I ran into him out here. I met him. Oh, okay. I, I met Ron House out here. And uh, uh, boy, what, what's up with him? I haven't seen him in decades. He passed, he passed oh. away. We did a revival of El Grande, the Coca-Cola. Right. That's how I met him. Uh, we did it out in L.A. I mean, originally. Yeah. Right. No, no. But we did a, we did a revival maybe, I guess, 10 years ago now. And at the at the uh, the theater company that's at the uh, Santa Monica Airport, and he was having trouble with his voice. Um, it seemed it seemed like it was he had a scratchy throat all the time, and it turned out we found out later that it was uh, cancer. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear yeah, that. So talented, nice guy. Yeah, he was a great guy. In fact, I met him in Edinburgh 
because I had taken a play to Edinburgh. I met him there, and he and their company was the Low Moan Spectacular. Right. Uh, he and Alan Shearman really wrote El Grande de Coca Cola, uh, and, you know, and, and performed in it. And you know, right. And that's and that's where I met them, and I brought them into New York, and the rest sort of was history for for all of us. Uh, but Ron was great. Ron was a very sweet, sweet man. And I was friends with him all these years. I mean, we did that in a long, long time ago. And we we remain very close friends until until the very end. Uh, yeah. Anyway, you got out to L.A. Yeah. Well, okay. Chicago Mafia. My little Chicago Mafia. And it was also Iris Golden, who just passed away years ago. Uh -huh ago who uh did some writing out here and then uh uh and then just didn't like the business and so uh she became a, a corporate headhunter and she did extremely well uh she and her wife lita and uh they moved uh to northern california and john clementi who's still here somewhere occasionally we reconnect mm -hmm. and he um he stopped he didn't want to, uh, bill and i were the only ones who stayed in it that i know there was a guy named rich lever who moved out here with us and we lost contact a couple years after he moved out here we just lost contact with him if anybody knows where rich lever is does really good impressions and um uh but that was the group we we moved out here and alan was already here Right. And, and he I, uh, he was doing quite, quite well by himself. MASH, the Carol Burnett show. He was right. Yeah, he right. Was. And so, yeah, he was. Now you, you, you did OK. You, you, uh, in the uh, those years, you, you appeared on Rhoda. You, uh, you appeared on MASH a couple of times. Uh, Nurse Abel was one of your characters. <laughs> characters in quotes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nurse Abel. Well, yeah, well, well, nurse nurse, nurse Abel. Abel. Come on. But, you know, that's, that's, that's that was a, um, that was it was fun. It was really nice and oh, sure. And uh, um, uh, I mean, when you get a whole look at the landscape and how it, I want to say how it works, but nobody knows how it works really. But I don't think. But uh, you look at how it is. Um, every job where you're not being mistreated is a good job. <laughs> it's a it's a. Here, here. It's a really nice thing to get hired. And it's because uh, somebody asked me recently, a student asked me about um, uh, the people who came through the groundlings who I've seen all these years teaching and, and, and performing and, uh, and, and said, um, who stood out? Did you know that so-and-so was going to be a star? And I said, I said, with all respect to all the great people who did really well and they're all fabulous. Right. And I said, I, I can't tell you how many came through here who you never heard of who were really good too. And mm -hmm. so it's just, mm -hmm. so yeah. So playing, playing whatever I got to play was pretty. Um, you you have, you have over the course of your time in the ground leagues and we'll, we'll get to that shortly. Uh -huh. You have had the chance to work with and nurture the most amazing talent. Yes, of course it's we all, the stuff that we've gotten, performers we that, that have come out of the groundlings and we'll 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 do a i'll, I'll do a roll call just <laughs> so you know I, we're gonna there'll be a little produced segment that that drops in before at some point before we talk about yeah. the groundlings so we don't have to ask well tell us about the story of the groundlings so we, you don't have to do oh good i'm so glad honestly yeah, no 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 you're not gonna do it we're not, we don't need any of that becoming we, like uh the pledge of allegiance no no, no 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 that, that there'll be i'm gonna the whole little produced thing which yeah. we're gonna drop in and uh we'll do a run of the names but it it is quite remarkable. It is uh, the incubator, the the talent incubator that it it was and still is to this day. Uh, it, it's when you consider how important comedy is from a commercial point of view to to the business. Uh, it's it is a gold manufacturing factory. In, well, in in a lot of ways. Yeah, gold shows up there, and then. We teach him how to improvise and write and do sketches and indeed, indeed. But we'll like I said, we'll yeah. we'll get yeah. to all that. So anyway, so uh you you had other credits like you you appeared on the White Shadow, ER, great credit, uh Webster, Cheers, Frasier, uh Strong Medicine, Reno nine one one. And you were the lead on a, a, a show that I remember called uh, Sherman Oaks, which was yeah, I was, was kind of an ensemble thing, yeah. but uh, but yeah, and I uh, I'm still friends with a lot of those people. That was That's a good really show. Fun. 
was really fun. You also did a lot of work on FX's Son of the Beach. Yeah, I wrote songs. Wrote, I wrote it. Yeah. Wrote it. You, you, were co- <laughs> you, you have co-authored uh, three TV theme songs, it, it, it says, but it doesn't say what they are. Okay. Well, let me see if I can remember. What um, are they? Let me see if I can remember all the uh, women in prison was one uh, only lasted a season, but I loved it. These were with uh, Ray Colcord. Uh, we were uh, we did a lot of writing together and he but he did over like 700 TV and film uh, scores and things like that. But, and mm-hmm. we wrote up a theme for Project Literacy together. But we wrote uh, Women in Prison and he had produced it. It was um, uh, it had somebody who was a Tom Jones sound alike. To, to do the theme. It was really wonderful. What was the other one? I think Best Friends was another one. How can I not remember them? Scorch. That was the third. Scorch. Oh, great title. <laughs> great title. Uh, not not a whole lot rhymes with it, but oh, okay. You know, porch. Oh, we didn't. Yeah, we didn't. <laughs> I, 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 we, I mean, Borch, Borch, Morch. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's, that's great. Anyway. Uh, all right. You also did a one woman show called Cats, Music and Characters, which won a Drama Log Award for Best Performance. Yep. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you. Uh, you wrote a play called Codependently Yours, uh, which was an L.A. Uh, Weekly Award nominee. Yep. Uh, you've also done a film, sh- uh, a, a, a short film called uh, Shufini. Shudini. Shudini. Sorry. Glory contact lens. Uh, when did you make Shudini and, and, uh, I'm in the nineties and it was, yeah, it's a, um, it's, it's a, one of those, you know, those infomercials with the women sitting on the couch and then they, yeah, keep, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was one of those. And it was a, a shoe that, um, they've started to kind of make it, but since then, but it's like, it, it's 27 different kinds of pairs of shoes in one bag. So you can make it in heels and every oh, shoe. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, work. great. Oh, cool, cool, cool. And, um, somewhere I can send, maybe find the video and send it to you, but it's, it's, uh, it was fun. It was really, really fun. We were just at the Chattanooga Film Festival and uh, being, being feted there. That's F-E-T-E-D. Right. Right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, one of the, the real pleasures was they had lots and lots of short films. And as a as a form, you know, it's there's oh my god, the people were so inventive. Uh, I, I I fall in love with with shorts. So yeah, I'm 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 fascinated by by people's shorts now. So. I love shorts. I love shorts. And uh and uh, when I first moved out here, uh, Bill Steinkeller and I would go to see the every year in I think it was in Pasadena they would show the animated shorts that came out. Mm-hmm. All these, and, and that's when. Um, uh, can't think of his name. Come on, Pixar. Oh, uh, uh, the... this is terrible. We'll 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 drop it, it ha- in. It happens. Please drop it in as though I remembered it, will you? I, right. I mean, it's just. Uh, uh, but anyway, we saw we saw some of his first things and um, uh, from Doctor. Pixar. Yeah. Yeah. It was mm. uh, it was great. So anyway, yeah, we we um. Uh, I love shorts too. And I heard your podcast about that. And and I looked up Piaf because I've got to decide whether I not I want to see it. I was fascinated by what you, oh, man. What you said about it. It is. I, I'm still trying to track down the, the director. We haven't been and, able to find order. her yet. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, well, I did get uh, something back from, from uh, Oscilloscope, the American distributor. Oh, good. And, uh, they're planning a, a campaign to release the, the, uh-huh. the film here. And I'm, I'm trying to say, well, I don't want to wait to, to meet her until you do your release. I'll, I'll talk it up then, man. But can I talk her up now, too? So she is. I'm still haunted by that fucking movie. OK, but what I want to know is, OK, you just have, I'm, I mean, obviously, I don't want you to give away the ending to people listening now. But I mean, am I going to walk out of there saying it just kind of ended in the middle of nothing? The as I sat there through the movie, I, I kept thinking to myself, where the fuck is this going? How, where, where, how does this end? And the place where it ended, I can tell you, I, my reaction was, oh yeah, that, of course that's where this would end. It was- Okay, it, it ends. Was incredibly uh, sensual, uh, compelling, unfathomable. And yet I understood it completely. 
Yeah. Okay. What a wonderful cinematic experience. I, the I, setup is remarkable. It's the the director and Oren is looking for the connection between humans and animals and plants. And she has accomplished something filmically that, yeah, I think she's, I mean, I, I think she's that, onto something. That works for me. Connection so, between humans, animals and plants. And she's Israeli, right? She is Israeli. She is uh, mm. working in Germany now. Mm. Anyway, so uh, so we've oh, and then you 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 published a book called Hipwrecked. My uh -huh. my favorite was that my health insurance sucked, and so I went to India. Yeah, this actually happened. This actually happened. I uh, almost fifteen years ago found out I needed my hip joints replaced, which I was too young and too thin for i didn't understand that and they said oh no these things happen and uh uh they said it could have been from dancing it could have been from athletics it could have been from you know a round of steroids when you were sick anything so um too many jokes yeah right <laughs> too many <laughs> anyhow uh they said um yeah you have to have this done <laughs> and my health insurance was just terrible it didn't cover enough for us to afford the out-of-pocket. And so um, my husband looked up. Um, can you stop for a second? I'm going to cough. <laughs> oh, sure. We can, we can absolutely, we absolutely can. We, we edit we, this. We, 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 okay. we cut and paste. We, we, we edit. <laughs> okay. So. All right. Uh, so, so uh, you needed to have your, your. Hip joints replaced. Both of them. Both of them. And uh, so. Uh, uh, I guess too much jumping around or something. So anyway, they uh, are, we, my health insurance was horrible and uh, I didn't know it was horrible until I needed that. And um, until you needed health care, until I needed health care, it's and it. And the beat goes on. Uh, 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 so we, what, my husband, Rob, found, uh, looked at medical tourism and he researched it. And we found out that India was the place uh, to go for that kind of surgery. So we had a conversation through a, a, an agency that handled it and a conversation with a doctor there. And I sure didn't want to go to India. I wanted to be home, but I didn't feel I had much choice. Um, and so we, what what did it cost there versus here? I can't answer that now. It's so long ago, but I I know that it was um, uh, as a fraction. It was at least half as expensive, at least. But um, and that included physical therapy and three weeks there, and I mean, included everything. Mm -hmm. So um, we there. Those would all have been a la carte here, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I had I had three visits a day from the doctor. That was I do remember this. They charged us fifteen dollars a visit. I remember that. And by the way, we're still friends. We're hmm. still in touch with him. This is a Dr. Harsha Hegde. I want to say his name. Wonderful human being and a hmm. terrific surgeon. But we went over there. And this was pretty quick from the moment we found out I had to do this to our doing this. I just wanted, if it had to happen, I wanted to get it over with. And um, friends were scared. I was scared. Everybody said, let us know. Let us know how you are. So I waited till the second surgery was done. They were two days apart or a day apart. And uh, But I kept writing about it just so I could log in everything that had happened and I sent an email off after the second surgery to everybody, letting them know I was fine. And it's the other side of the world. So I'm going to bed, but they're waking up and reading it, right? So when I woke up, I had 25 emails waiting for me, and I didn't feel like I was so far away. And it calmed me down. And then I started writing, and then everybody would write back. And so I started, I decided to take them on the uh, entire trip with me, including how I was feeling from moment to moment, except when it got really dark 
because when you after you've had anesthesia and that's wearing off, it gets really dark. I didn't go into details about the demons that were coming up because I knew that would be gone in a few days. But but I really took them through it. And then I found myself wanting to entertain them. So hmm. and they would write things. And so it would give me things to notice and things. To, it, it made me more aware of things other than uh, my poor, sad plight, you know, that <laughs> that I was feeling at the time. <clears throat> so. So many people said to me, you have a book. These emails are, are, are really fun. And when I came home, I took out all the in jokes and I went back and wrote the narrative. Of, and that does have all the details in it, what what things cost and all that. And, cool. and, and all the people who'd helped me and all that. And so I wrote the book as it went through that up until... Um, eight weeks after when I was off the walker because I had a, I had to have a walker for eight weeks because they didn't want me putting a lot of pressure on the, uh, on the joints. How, how are your hips today? They're fantastic. I mean, fantastic. And you can ask almost anyone who's had this kind of surgery. Uh, and they'll tell you that you had no idea you were in that much pain until after the surgery. Hmm. I mean, I, I, uh, it was like a gift. It's not a hundred percent. It's, it's 99% or 98%. Oh, well, gosh, Hey, you you know, still, wow. What a, it's a a remarkable testament to. They got better at it. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sure we. Now it's even better than when I had it. And how much time did you stay in India after the surgery? It was the whole thing was three weeks. Wow. You you should almost write an update, an updated chapter about, you know, how the last 15 years have been. Put the whole thing out again because nothing has changed. Yeah. Well, it's in terms nothing, of nothing. Yeah, our the the insanity of our we don't well, we don't have a health care system. We have a health insurance system. It's not the same thing as a health care system. Right. If the doctors would really like to be able to do better, their hands get tied. It's when the first question anyone walks in the door when 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 you're sick isn't hey how can we fix you it's how are you going to pay for this i know that is barbaric it is disgusting the inmates are running this asylum but hey that's a whole other well, subject yeah you know, let's what, talk another time let's about, talk, talk about so throwing uh, 11,000 people off the healthcare rolls so you know don't get us started <laughs> we're we'll get up on the soapbox you'll never get us off it's uh, a deal all right so you finally bump into the groundlings. You, you've you described attending the first performance and immediately wanting to uh, to take class or at least work with with the group. Yeah. Um, there, were, uh, there were women like Lorraine Newman. Uh, you have described that she was doing non-prop characters and it blew you away. I didn't say non-prop, did I? Yeah, you did. You described it as non-prop characters. I, I can't remember ever using that term in my life, but if I said it, I, I believe it. And I, it was I, I'm, I'm lifting a quote. Non-prop. Okay. I, but what, what, you, what, what you were describing is the fact that they were dynamic. They weren't just, hey, I'm the wife. Hey, I'm... I'm you know, oh, 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 pro- I see what you mean. I thought you meant she wasn't using any props. No, oh. no, I, no, no, I mean, she, she oh, was... Oh, no, I get it. The character choices were, I'm not a fucking prop here. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. was, um, well... That's what was going on at the ground. It's not that isn't to say we, uh, we allow me to explain your quote to you. <laughs> that, that it, is, it, it probably it, was taken out of context in India when she uh, came yeah. out of surgery. <laughs> yeah, they, they, uh, yeah, I mean, none of them were. They came out and they just did, they were doing uh, it was an electric night with women, uh, have uh, heavily populated with women and men but there it wasn't two women and and eight men it it was like in fact there were maybe 25 people in the show it was so rich with people and mm. uh but Lorraine just kept doing character after character and and that's where I came from in my heart and I thought yeah. oh god I want to be here and they were so much fun and I when and I again I was with Bill Steinkellner there and we went in uh, one of the other people John Clementi and the group had seen them first and said, you've got to see this group. So we went to see it. And there are more people on stage than in the audience. It's a really tiny theater, the Oxford. And so um, we approached Gary Austin afterwards and said, 
uh, this is fantastic. Do you have classes? We weren't trying to get in the show. We just wanted to work out someplace good because we love Second City. And and now we wanted a place here. He he told you that you would have to learn our vocabulary. Right. All right. What was that vocabulary? Well, he just meant there's a way that we teach. And you're obviously, you've had experience. You've been working out for, for years and you took classes and you know how to improvise. But there's there's a, you just have to learn how I teach and, and, um, and what we do here, which was not at all incompatible. So that was it. I mean, I, 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 uh, there wasn't a language. We didn't have a formal school until I think it was 78 or something when we started the school. Right. There were six of us who, uh, as in my recollection, uh, put the school together and, um, and then we started to have a, 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 a vocabulary you could quote based on everything we'd been doing. But but Gary, I understood what we understood. We didn't it, care. It was a metaphorical vocabulary. Yeah. And we said, we, we said, we're fine. We just want a place to work out that's good. We liked it right away. We made friends right away. And I think it was <clears throat> a couple of months and they put us in the show. How would you describe the nature of his methodology? His what was all right. So, as you approach a character, uh, what do you look at first in order to define the character? Well, in those days, we were still. It was always it was experimental and exploratory constantly. It, it was never okay. Here's the exercise we do first, and then you always do that. You do that. Mm -hmm. Gary would just throw us up there and try different things. But the thing about Gary that stood out for me is you didn't have to entertain him. Once you were part of the group, he was really interested in what you were doing. So you could be in a slump and he'd be, I, I could see him s s staring and watching and taking in what I was doing and, uh, and, uh, and deciding what to do next and what to have us try next. And, um, and so he was really interested in where it took you. And he he could let a scene go on so long that people just wanted to go home. And uh, it, it, this is in class. Mm -hmm. And and uh, it's because he was interested in what was coming out more than, oh, here's the entertainment value. Here's where it should end. Here's where everybody be comfortable. So that was really good for for me in those days. Well, certainly that's got to do great things for your confidence because you're not being judged on the immediate. It's not right. about the joke. You're obviously. So if if you're not mining for the joke, all right, then you got to be mining for something more substantive than just some fucking joke. You got to right. be mining we were for never looking the character. For a joke. Yeah, that was never what it was. Obviously, we wanted to be funny. We were net and that was never discussed. We're looking for the joke. And by the way, I don't look down on jokes, but there's a place for them. And there's and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think jokes are fantastic, and it's hard to write a really great joke. I think it's I'm not, a, I'm not a joke writer, and but I think that uh, when some jokes come out of a character, uh, character behavior, and character just point of view and discovery that um, um, that in an improv is a different thing. So um, it, it's it it lands as a joke. But, it, but it's a different it, presentation. And it it is almost always so situational. It has yeah. to do with the little world that has been created inside the improv. And it's happening in the moment. That's the difference. Because if there's a lot of stuff, there are a lot of improvs that are fantastic. And if you and if you write the scene out, it's great. And there are a lot that if you write the scene out, you, you could never get it produced anywhere. It's, it doesn't it doesn't have the right rhythm and it doesn't it it doesn't sustain but but everything's its own thing but improv can I mean there's long form improv that's fantastic where something can go on a long time and you don't ever get tired of it it's just wonderful but it's just a different presentation and and uh, that's when it. when the LA Times theater critic Sylvia Drape uh, when uh, Sylvia Drake when she first saw the groundlings, uh, she wrote a rave review when she said uh, this could be the start of something big. Yeah, is that was she, for me. She wrote. Yeah, I got there after there, but they had that review after that, but they had that review up on the wall for a long time. But she saw something and she was not wrong. <clears throat> she 
when you look at, again, the people who have come out of there, and it's not just, it's, it's, these are, these are performers who are succeeding all over the place. Uh, these are just the ones who I'm, just, Jim Cashman, uh, he's plays Jamie in the progressive commercials, which right. I think that's a fantastic little world that they've created. It is. Uh, and, and Stephanie Courtney, of course, she plays Flo in, in the progressive commercials. Right. But that world comes to life because of their because of their improv background. They brought a whole odd world to life and, and damned if if the advertising agency didn't go right along with them. Well, that's there. That's where you, that's the whole point. They let them do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Trusted them and they let them do it. And it, it turned out to be very successful for them. If, uh, if you go back and you look at the very first progressive commercial with Flo, it's it's really contained. It's just a little store and she's just, you know, the little clerk in, in a little insurance store with all the white boxes. And there's just something in her performance that's so, I know they must have shot it a thousand times. It's a commercial. And they do that on commercial sets. But man, she it just looks so fresh. She's a terrific improviser. So see, they're great. They're just great. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mikey Day, uh, just of Saturday Night Live. Ben Falcone, uh, really talented guy. Will Ferrell and Will Forte. Heidi Gardner, uh, Anna Gasteyer, Kathy Griffin, Phil Hartman, who we'll come back to. Uh, Cheryl Hines, uh, Jan. Jan Hooks, Chris Kattan. Jan Hooks was not Jan Hooks was not a groundling. <clears throat> she oh take that one off. Okay. Jan Hooks used to come to the shows, but she was not a groundling. Oh well, that is that. I'm gonna take that. Uh, Wikipedia has has her mislisted then. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Kudrow, Phil Lamar, John Lovitz, Melissa McCarthy, uh, McCarthy, Edie McClurk, Pat Morita. Of course, we mentioned Lorraine Newman, Sherry O'Terry, Cassandra Peterson. Uh, Maya Rudolph, Mindy Sterling, Julia Sweeney, and, and Kristen Wiig, all members of the main company. Now, to get into the main company, you had to pass through a, a, several curtains of fire. Not in the beginning. Uh, so, so, so some of them got, there was, uh, you, you said when, when you got into the groundlings, you filled out. Uh, you an, filled application. Out, <laughs> an application. An application. See so, the uh, jaws that have dropped when I've told that to people. On yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, <laughs> but it was a different time and we'd had a lot of experience and, and Gary, uh, Gary just wanted the, the a big family of people doing this stuff. And, yeah, and, uh, and I, John I, when, Maxwell was our other director. When, when I auditioned to get into the classes and, and I, and I took two, uh, I, I know that, that at that point, I think there was already the whole structure where, all right, here, here's here's the obstacle course you got to run. And, and at every point, right. there are people shooting at you and man, a thousand <laughs> different ways to die. And each of them are horrible. And and yeah, you'll get three shots at this. And if you don't make this, hey, and then if you, if you get into the Sunday company, you, you know, you yeah. got you're not going to live there forever, pal. You, you got, you know, tick, tick, tick. Yeah. And if you get into the main company, get the fuck out of here. I, as as I sat there uh, in 1985, staring at wait wait, I, I really like this, but in order to to break into this, I I I confess I I wilted. Well, it's the longest running audition, and it shouldn't oh it should be a place to learn improv and have fun. Uh, there, I don't I don't know how much I want to say this on a podcast, but there I, I have a political uh, difference. I I don't think we should cut people, but. I'm in the minority. And I, but the thing is, it, it, unless there are personality problems, however, they cannot take everybody in. That's oh just not how it works. You can't hire everybody. Uh, and, and it's, it's definitely by the end, it's a subjective, subjective casting call. Oh, but that's true. It's like, who, what do we need in the company? Who do we, uh, who feels like, um, who are you dying to write with? And, and it's, it's, uh, it doesn't mean somebody else isn't talented, and and even people in the company don't always agree on who was, uh, who who didn't make it. They they vote, and and that's that's how it works. And it's I can't stand the heartbreak aspect of it. But as schools go, it's a great school, and it's a great um, and it's a great uh, atmosphere of creativity for from from most of us. 
And the truth of the matter is, this is a hard business. If if you are if you're taking the if you're taking ground lease classes because you aspire to 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 be a groundling and because that is a fantastic launching pad, then well, yeah, that that there's rigor is not a terrible thing. It won't make you worse. It will only make you better. And even if you don't succeed here, you, the, everything you learn here is going to service you a thousand different ways, a thousand different places. It, I, I don't think anyone walks. Yeah, it, it's a challenge to your to your feelings. And it, yes, of course, it's not. It, it's look, nobody likes any form of rejection, and it's not even really about if you don't succeed here. What it's like if, to me, everything in life is analogous to dating. You just weren't a match on both sides. And, 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 and if you, if the sooner I could have seen that before I met my husband, the more fun I would have had, maybe the earlier I'd have met my husband, I don't know. But the thing is all the times that my heart was breaking and, and then I look back and say, that never would have worked out. What was I thinking? I just so desperately wanted, that wasn't like the right match for me. And so I, I'm not saying people could say I never could have gotten in, but I, I mean, there are people who didn't get in who are really successful and magnificent. And I don't want to say their names here because I don't know if they want people to know they tried to get in and didn't. But in one case, somebody said to me, uh, I, I I can understand now why I didn't get in because the kind of stuff I do just wasn't going to be, the kind of stuff I write wasn't going to be part of a show that looked like that. It's just too it's just too odd in my own way. And yet I'm talking about stuff that's really successful. So it's. Uh... Look, the, the, the reason that I didn't continue was because the, the thing that the second instructor kept hitting me for, and she was right, was I kept writing. Yeah. So rather than being in the moment, I was I was scripting it in my head and I, and she was right. And so until I and that was happening for a, for a bunch of other reasons. And so un, un, unless I could lick that, yeah, she was absolutely right. I, I, my improv was, it wasn't, I was not nearly as good in the second class as I was in that first class. Cause I was never as in the moment as I needed to be. Right. You take so, it for what, what it's going to help you with. Oh, and you, and you move on. I, I, Hey, as a, as a former student, it's awesome. Hey, uh, the lessons that I learned at your feet, Thank you. Were I, I think of them all the time, um, and it has to do with with the nature of improv, but just the 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 gentle nurturing way that you that you brought all those improv lessons home, which really learning to trust the nature of yes and, and really it's it's there's a there's something transcendent that happens when you're in the middle of an improv and you suddenly forget that you're in the middle of an improv. Yes. And it's, and suddenly the improv stops and you look back and you have no real memory of having just done the damn thing. You weren't there. You vanished. And some other version of you that was in the moment performed. Whoa. And everyone seems to have liked it because they probably did better than you would have. That, that's no, that's exactly, exactly right. I mean, that was my first experience at Second City where uh, I had that moment. I was in a scene. I was in the middle of a scene and all of a sudden people were laughing and it startled me out of the scene. I, I don't know what I said, but I remember that moment. I, I'm, I, I remember that moment and it was uh, powerful. And every time I see somebody have it, it it's it's thrilling. Yeah. I had somebody in a, a musical improv class I taught where at one point I saw it click in. Cool. I saw it click in and he threw his head back and smiled. He was in the middle of a song. He was suddenly on top of the whole thing. And uh I don't know I don't know what made it happen. I but I just saw it happen. I got mm -hmm. to be there for it. And it's it wasn't like I gave him a note or told him to do something specific. No, he just you just keep opening up, opening up like like a kid navigating the world. And then you start to figure stuff out. <laughs> and figuring out what what makes you, whoever you are, what makes you funny 
And figuring out how to articulate that is not necessarily easy. No, it takes a long time and a lot of reps and a lot of people, um, um, some people know that and some people don't. Some people are in for the long haul and some people get very frustrated. Now, let, let, let's be utterly clear about one thing. Not everybody has a sense of humor. I, at least this is, this is, I utterly believe this. There are yes. people, and I think the marker of do you have a sense of humor or don't you is, can you laugh at yourself? Yeah, that's a good if, one. If if you can laugh at yourself, then you have a sense of humor. If you can't laugh at yourself, then you can only laugh at other people. Well, that's not having a sense of humor. That's bullying. And, you know, Donald Trump has no sense of humor. A notoriously thin skin, he cannot laugh at himself. I've never seen him laugh. Oh, he's he, he laughs, but it's always it's the schoolyard bully. It's it's the the cruelest laugh. That's why you've never connected it to a laugh, because as you understand laughter, that's not laughter. It's 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 like a jackal braying. But but <laughs> well, that's yeah. And some people think mean spiritedness is is comedy, and some people think uh uh some people's uh, biases they think are comedy. You're right. I, but I, he's down. I, I think we I would argue, but then again, I would that really. And if you can't laugh at yourself. I would say you don't have a sense of humor. You need to be able to laugh with others and not at others. Because really, comedy is such a is such a particular thing. It's such a collective thing. Uh, you know. And yet it's such a particular thing and and it can be hard for some people to see other people's humor uh i think of andy uh, andy kaufman who was brilliant and yet i can appreciate how some people would look at him and go i don't get it well yeah and i and i and not everybody's sense of humor is the same indeed this is true I mean, and, and even <laughs> people with with a sense of humor i think can look at different things and go all right i get this i don't get that I like this kind of humor. This uh, just we're so thin on me so fast. The the whole uh, area of humor and having a sense of humor and being able to appreciate it, you know. I would also say if you don't have a sense of humor, you don't you'll never be able to see irony because you need to be able to see that contrast in yourself first. The absurdity of your own situation, I I, I think, is where is where irony kind of starts and, and. Well, it's, it's what I say to a lot of students who are working on characters and saying, I'm trying to find a point of view. I always say, um, pay attention to what has your attention. Cause that's, that's really where your sense of humor is going to come from too. Indeed. I mean, there are Indeed. certain things that uh, I was saying this recently to a class for, for me uh, recently, what started to have my intention and would be funny to me are are entitled people, people who who think we're back to what we started with the uh, uh, delusion of royalty. The the, the people who um, uh, uh, people who have no patience for people who don't wait on them, yes, and don't and don't serve them, and they for some reason they strike me, uh, they fascinate me, and so some of these people strike me funny, and I get characters from it mm -hmm. and then and prior to that it was women with excessive face work and then i would say what what do you think when you see that in the morning this looks like the macy's parade you know the yeah, yeah. it's like what i'm not talking about I, i'm not saying nobody should have anything done to their face i'm just talking about the overkill and i'm and i'm thinking and so it's the same thing with humor it's like what what is it that makes you laugh that's your sense of humor in, in, indeed, and and really, you know what can what can make the dysmorphic personality funny is by going inside the dysmorph the dysmorphic point of view. You know, I think that to explore that point of view, to understand how it doesn't see itself correctly, but there's it's it's there in the humanity. There's they're suffering an extreme version of something that we all feel. It's just that they're feeling it in to such an extreme. This, what do I really look like? And does everyone approve of how I look? Yeah, or it's just different. I mean, sometimes I don't even wind up uh, doing the character with that thing. It's the thing going on that's that start that I make up. I make it up. 
right? Mm -hmm. I'm not doing psychoanalysis to somebody. I look at somebody and I decide, oh, I know where she shops. I know what she's doing today. I know what she's doing. And then just the same thing I did with the comic books in the wax wax paper. I'm making up my own stories, but, uh, uh, but a kind of, or you have observations about a kind of person uh, and you could be right or not, but if I'm not interacting with them, it doesn't matter if I'm right. I'm just grabbing a character. Right? You know, it, it's funny. I'm 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 talking about. We're, we're both. For me, it's all right. If I can, in order to write in their voice, I, I I need to know certain things about them, and in order to, I need their reference points. I I need you know their their slang, the way that you know their shorthand right. for, for things, right? Because that brings them to life inside my head, and and it's. Yes, the the process to figuring out how to bring something that isn't actually real into reality, so that other people can go, I recognize that. Right. This is this is our challenge. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, among many challenges. <laughs> yeah, among many, but but you know, <laughs> it's the the craft of improv is. Uh, it's it's acting kind of in its purest form. Yeah, I think again, I come back to jazz. I think of it as jazz acting yeah. slash writing, but it's um, uh, I'm not putting it on any kind of pedestal. It's just a it it's a, over anything else. I think I think artistic expression is artistic expression. I, they're they're and I'm kind of blown away anytime anybody does anything really well. I, um, but I I for me I. Um, it just opened up a world, and I think it's a better. It, it 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 says a lot about how people communicate. I mean, I teach corporate classes, and they'll they'll um, they'll say we want to collaborate better, or we want to do team building, or um, I you know I worked with the L.A. Opera. Did you know that? No, no, no. How interesting. For I had eleven years. Josh Winograd, who who just went to Rice College, he's doing something there. He was the artistic. Um, Did you get to work with Peggy Guggenheim? No. Oh, at this Patty year. Guggenheim. Yeah, at the Groundlings, Patty. Oh, yeah. She no, was... not 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 Patty. Uh, oh. Peggy Peggy Guggenheim. She. she no, she no, died. no. Yeah, no. yeah, I know she is. No, I didn't. No, what I didn't work with the main opera people. They have a young artist program for young adults. Oh. And the people they're grooming. And Josh gotcha. Winograd was the artistic director of that program, and uh, and he called me in and said, um, I want. Uh, to help them find other ways to be on stage. That was the goal. Huh. So we sat and talked a lot and he got told me about, he, he said, this is how opera singers think. This is how they're treated. This is yeah. how they train. And he, he really gave me a lot of information and we, uh, I did classes with them. So um, uh, I did, classes with the Virginia Avenue project were, which were at risk kids. Lee mm. Kern is the woman who started that and they uh, they were in operation for 25 years and they would work with um, uh, them in all kinds of uh, ways with the arts but she wanted an improv program there too. And so I've seen what it does um, for um, for a humane way of relating to each other. And yet, I don't want to. I don't want to sound too precious with this because when we're on well, stage, we're horsing around. We're trying to get laughs, right? Uh, you, you don't have to put it on a pedestal. I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I as uh, yeah, I'm. I think in, improv is is what a. Uh, I'm grateful that that I took classes in improv. I'm I'm always in awe of of great improv performers. And I, Gil and I are just so grateful that that you sat down with us today to thank you for asking to have us. this conversation. It was it was it was great to catch up. Yeah, and thanks for remembering me. Even you know that was a long time ago, wasn't it? I have I have used your I told the story about myself in that class simply because well there's your brother again and uh, before we well before we got. Well, yes, I, I need your brother's phone, your, your his his vital statistics. I'm I'm tracking him down. That that's that's one of my next sure it's conversations. Turn the recorder off. I'll give it to you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh, damn, damn, damn. And, I, and, and we're gonna dox him all over the place. And I'm and I must say I, I'm really happy that he took the uh, improv classes with you because when we first started writing, we we acted everything out. 
Oh. Uh, you know, it was is the two of us would, and then we would beat each other over the head, changing it and fixing it and making it. This isn't this isn't scary enough, or this isn't funny enough, or this wasn't ironic enough. And it was all about, if you remember, Alan, we would at the desk, we would just act everything out. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. Uh, uh, improv got under my skin and got under our skin, and uh, I, I think it really played a very significant part in the nature of our creative relationship yeah. and how we were able to do what we did. And I think we brought a lot of that improv spirit to Tales from the Crypt when we took over that show. Yeah. So it's all your fault, Phyllis. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> I, li I like to take the blame for something. <laughs> something uh, <is> fun. <laughs> so uh, I, I say I say thank you and, uh, thank you. And, and and thank you everyone for listening in. We'll we'll see you next time. All right, that's that's the podcast portion done. All okay. Right. Uh thank you so much. I, I I hope you enjoyed that half as much as I did. I I well, I don't know how much you enjoyed it, but I did enjoy it. It was fun. It was really fun. Thank you. I hope I gave you what you needed. Uh, oh my oh my gosh. That was great. Well, th Thanks. this will be up on Tuesday. We we publish great. at some whenever I get done cutting it together. And like I said, I'm I'm, I'm gonna do a, a big section on on the groundlings just to to talk about their history and all all the people, but in some of the process. Uh yeah, because it was unnecessary. You, you that's not, not necessary. Process was much more interesting. Yeah, about. no, I mean, I've been, uh, it's for some reason lately, people have been wanting to talk to me about this stuff. And then they always say, how did the groundling start? And I think, oh, I don't want to keep, you know, I wasn't there at the beginning. I got there like right after they started, but I'm considered one of the founders. And I'm. And it's like, who cares if you're not? Yeah, it's not yeah. your story. But, you know, yeah. I, I think, I think. Well, no, actually, I don't mean because it's not about me. I mean, how no, interesting. No, no. No, but, but, you know, I mean, I, if we're interviewing you, I want you to talk about you. I know, you know, the institution is interesting, but there's another way to present that information. Mm. So it doesn't, so you're not bogged down with it. We have the technology. And so we use it and we're going to. Right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. So let me tell you how to get hold of Alan. Uh, please, please, please. And I'll even give him a heads up too. So let's see. Yes. Tell, tell him danger is coming. <laughs> danger, danger, Will Robinson. Uh, let me see here. Um, um, I'm gonna go to the. Here we go. Uh, uh, okay, it's Alan with two L's. Yes, I've always known this. I, I know this as well as okay. I know my own bloody name. All right, Alan D, as in David, Alan D. Katz at Gmail. Okay. And uh, his phone is 310-308-9800. Uh, so uh, Alan D. Katz at Gmail. Uh, 310-308-9329. That's it. Ruby Green, thank you so much. I now, now, now you'll call him and tell him that about this and that, and you'll, and you'll tell him who we are, and he'll go, oh, shit, I remember that asshole Gil Adler 100 years ago. He would. He, he kept hounding me. He kept hounding me. I, <laughs> I don't recall why uh, or how I knew him, but I knew him before I knew this Alan Katz. Right. I have a... Um, a Number of friends, I mean, really close friends, and do not remember meeting them. I don't remember meeting them, but I mean, yeah. they, and they were uh, a lot of them were, were groundlings, but I don't remember some of them. Absolutely, I remember the moment I met sure. them. People, hmm. I just, I just don't know, and it's like we've always been friends. And then some people who say. Uh, who I know from all kinds of circles. And they'll say, don't you remember I took a class from you? And I think, no, you took class with <laughs> I was at the gym once and I saw a woman and I thought, oh God, I can't think of her name. I got to I gotta remember her name. I can't make eye contact with her because uh, I got to think of her name. And I was, uh, 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 I was, uh, I went, did my workout as I was coming back, she was stretching and I looked at her and I thought, I don't know her. She's on a soap opera. 
when I'm home making lunch, it, it, that's the soap opera that's on. I've seen her face when I'm, it, when I'm it, I didn't know it all. Just assume, I always assume it's some student I can't remember. And I, yeah. and I'm, I'm better with faces than, than names. Cause it's, cause it's, you know, it's sure. Crowley's about to have their 50th anniversary. Amazing. So that's, that's a lot of, you know, it's a lot to remember, but. When I, when I first came to town, I, was part of a pickup Sunday afternoon softball game with a lot of stand-ups, and a lot of guys. This is 1985. You know, hadn't you know, they were successful stand-ups, but they hadn't made it bigger than that. Jerry Seinfeld was part of it. Tom Arnold was part of the of this this group. A bunch of really terrific stand-ups. Everybody did Vin Scully, so the whole the whole <laughs> softball game was 30 different Vin Scullys out in the field, you know, doing Vin Scully for every fucking play. Uh, it was great fun. Great, great, great. But pickup game. And all right, a couple of years, a lot of years go by. Now I'm, I'm running, I'm, I'm in my second season, third, my third season doing Tales from the Crypt. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, life's good. I get a call in my office. My my uh, assistant says, Tom Arnold's on the phone for you. I'm like, oh, okay. hmm. So I get on the phone to Tom Arnold and, uh, hey, Tom, how are you? I figure, hey, it's great, man. And uh, yeah, we start talking and uh, he segues rather quickly in, in, into Roseanne, the Roseanne show. They're just having all kinds of trouble on the Roseanne show. And he says, uh, look, you know, you, you've done all these. these what? You know, I can't imagine. He said you did MASH, you, you did this. So, you know, can, could you come over and, and you know, I'd like you to, I'd like you to practically take over the Roseanne show. And of course, it occurs to me, oh, he's got the wrong Alan Katz. Right. I, I, I think my old softball, my old softball friend is calling to, to catch up because I'm now running Tales from the Crypt and he runs the show. <laughs> no, he's he's what calling the other Alan man. Katz, the motherfucker. So I, I, I finally said, um, Tom, uh, I'd love to say yes. I, I you know, I, you know, I wrote that would be an interesting experience taking over you know, the Roseanne show. But I'm running a show here and I'm, I'm the other Alan Katz. I'm the guy who used to play softball with. <laughs> And there's just this long, it was, I knew uh, the awkward pause because I'd been in the room so many times. But at least you were on the on another show. Right, yeah. But, but he said, oh, hey, how are you, man? <laughs> Smooth. Uh, oh, man. Anyway, so. Well, yeah. Roseanne, well, he didn't take it over. He, he worked as a consultant and she liked him. But he was she was so awful to people. And uh, Jeff Harris was his very good buddy. And when Jeff left the show, she that they asked Alan to take over. And he said, Jeff's like my best friend. I'm not going to do that. Well, so so they tracked him down in the end. Well, he should know that time the job could have been mine. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. You have from everything I've heard, you wouldn't want it. Everybody I know. No, I know. I know. But, but everybody they start out liking her. They start but, out saying, I don't know what the big deal is about her. And then. But they would have been paying, paying way more than I was being paid to crypt. I can promise yeah. you. I can promise you. I, I would I would have a pile of fuck you money now that I do not have. Yeah. Oh, well. Could have earned it. Uh, okay. <laughs> hey, I, I work, we worked for Joel Silver. Right? You know, come on. Oh, okay. You know. Fair enough. No, no, no big deal. You know, we, we know from screamers. Anyway, thank you so much for. Thank you for really spending fun. the time, and uh, I look forward to 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 continuing to to touch base and see how how you're doing. I I'll let you know as soon as this is published. I'll I'll send you the Great. link. And uh, thank you again. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Gil. Nice meeting you. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye all now. Right. Uh, and all right, Gil, you're going to stay on. Right. Okay, because we're going to do our intro. All right. All right. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> How old is she? 76. Is she really? She is. Well, how old is Alan? In his 80s? He's got to be up there, so we, we better get to him soon. <laughs> I'll tell wow. him we said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Don't don't waste the day. Yeah, right. <laughs> but and I'm not going to. You know, like, like I said, I this is a conversation I've been dying to have. Right and uh, and he's had a fast a fantastic career in his own right and 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 worth a conversation. So it's, what's he uh, what's he doing now? Is he retired or? Oh, well, I guess we're going to have to ask. Yeah. Uh, well, let's do the intro. Yeah. All right. Three, two, one. No, you drink first, and then it's three, two, one. <laughs> I've got everything backwards. 
<laughs> you drink first and then it's three, two, one. Let me write that down. Hold on. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the How Not to Make a Movie podcast. I'm Alan Katz. And I'm Gil Adler. See, I was playing with the timing there of that. I was working on, on if I wait, will it make it funnier? Will it? I, I heard and I it didn't. <laughs> I always, see, further proof that comedy is hard and uh, harder for, for, for some and, and impossible for others. Which brings us to our guest tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually met Phyllis Katz in 1985, just after I got to Los Angeles, I took a class with the Groundlings and it was fantastic. Phyllis was my teacher. And uh, there's there's a, a whole other part to, to, to the Phyllis Katz story having to do with her brother, Alan Katz. We'll discuss all that in the, in the episode. But uh, Phyllis was one of the people who started the Groundlings School. And if you don't know who the Groundlings are, you know the people who've come out of there, people like Will Ferrell, Phil Hartman, an awful lot of people who, who performed on, on Saturday, Night, Saturday Night Live. It, it, it is an incubator for great comedic talent. And before and, that, she came out of Chicago and out yeah. of Second City, which was really the, the granddaddy of them all. Yeah. So uh, this is a show about comedy. It's about improv. It's about uh, how how to get to that place of of total honest, where truth lives. Here's uh, here's Phyllis. Give it a listen. There you go. Cool. Uh, so let me take these earphones off because my head is sweating. <laughs> oh yeah 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 yeah. Let me that. take them out. You there? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm still here. You, you you can un yes, I'm here. You have to unplug. You have to unplug. Alan, unplug. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unplug. What happened? You have to un unplug. Oh. Then you'll be able to hear me. Can you hear me now? You have to un un unplug, and, and then yeah, I'll come to the the the, uh, the speakers. If you unplug, no, wait, you, hold on, hold on, hold on. You, you have to unplug, and then you'll be able to hear me through the computer speakers. You there? Are, uh, yes, I'm. I'm here. Can you hear me? I unplug. I did. I, I I did. I can hear you through the headset. But when uh, I unplugged it. I couldn't hear you. Uh, that's. That ain't right. Especially, yeah. it should automatically default back to the computer speakers. All right, let me try. Let me try. Okay, I'm going to right. unplug it. One more time. Can Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? The default can... speaker has changed. No yeah. one does it. Okay. I can't hear you. Just Just say yes. <laughs> just say yes. All right. Well. All right. Well, I'm going to con. I'm going to contact Alan Katz uh, in the you know probably tomorrow. I'll, I'll I'll shoot him an email. How about now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, uh, I don't know why that doesn't work, but anyway, a um, couple of things. Uh, I I saw Todd yesterday. Yes. Uh, you know, he took over a new space in Burnaby out here, uh, much bigger than because he's, he's he's expanding, and he's and he's put together what he calls a museum. And he says to me, you know, would I have any interest in helping him do a Halloween party? Uh, the Saturday night before Halloween, hmm. which would be more about Tales from the Crypt. Hmm. So I said, well, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe how how would you do this? I mean, he said, well, I'm going to try to find a sponsor or two. And I said, because, you know, it'd be great, you know, if we can bring Alan up and maybe do something. And there's a possibility I may not be uh, in here around then. And if I'm not, though, I could probably do it from wherever I am. And we could tie it in, um, or do a Zoom or something. Sure. Um, and he seemed he seemed really interested in doing it. So I said I would talk it over with you and and let him know. But you know, you're you 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 would do something like that, right? I would absolutely. Hey, man, it, it's yeah. uh, it's all about getting out and meeting the fans and and, and promoing shit. And yeah, yeah, this this is this is the the game. So yeah, yeah. I'm I'm yeah. always I'll play it. However. Yeah. Anyway, so I told him I, I would mention it to you and see what you thought. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm there. Right, I'm apps. So. I'm apps. I'm game for anything. Fuck. Yeah. Right. I'm so uh, easy. These oh wait, days. we're still. You know, we're still recording. Let me get. Oh this. yeah. We'll, we'll stop recording. 